You're listening to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host today, Luke Nathan Phillips. And I'm joined today by my co-host, Silas Kolkarni. Uh, howdy, Silas. Good to see you. Hey, Luke. Good to see you. And uh, Silas and I are joined to get today by a very special guest, um, Daniel McCarthy. Daniel McCarthy is uh, the editor of Modern Age, a venerable conservative review. Uh, he's the director of the Robert Novak Journalism Fellowship, formerly was the editor of the American Conservative Magazine, worked on the Ron Paul 2008 campaign. You could say he's been around the block a few times in uh, conservative intellectual spaces. And uh, that actually is the main reason why we've brought him here today is because he uh, stands at the, uh, the center of a bunch of uh, different, uh, different uh, factions inside uh, conservative world. He brings together a lot of interesting thinkers uh, from various sides of the right who really illuminate really interesting things. So we're, uh, we're looking forward to uh, chatting with you about um, some of the, sit, uh, the situations in our country and ways that different conservative thinkers have thought about them, uh, Dan. Um, real quick, uh, this Daniel McCarthy is not running for the United States Senate in Arizona, although I'm sure that Daniel McCarthy could very much benefit from being mistaken from this Daniel McCarthy. Um, Additionally, uh, as a full disclosure, uh, I am, uh, I do have a piece under review at uh, the magazine Dan Edits, uh, Modern Age. And uh, as another full disclosure, Dan has for some years now been a big fan of my cats on Facebook. So if I uh, question him unfairly well, uh, I, I suppose that that personal interest there may be uh, part of my motivation there. So, but Dan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Luke. So uh, I thought we would go ahead and get started just with some uh, just with some uh, personal introduction, I guess, of uh, of of your your background, how you came to uh, to modern age, uh, but also generally uh, wh what you've been, uh, where your intellectual journey has uh, has taken you over the last two decades, I suppose, leading up into the Trump era. Um, so, uh, what what? Uh, how would you define yourself uh, in terms of uh, in terms of your intellectual development up to this point? Well, you know, uh, I get asked that question once in a while. In fact, uh, just last night, someone else had asked me, and I always feel as if there should be some kind of Batman origin story that I can share. Uh, maybe I could say that I was bitten by a radioactive Pat Buchanan back in 1992. Um, I was in uh, high school in the uh, early 1990s. So uh, 1992 was my freshman year. I graduate from high school in 1996. Uh, I become a, a college freshman in 1996. And that's a very interesting time in American politics. Uh, it's a point where, of course, uh, George H.W. Bush loses re-election to Bill Clinton. Uh, George H.W. Bush is challenged in 92 by uh, Pat Buchanan in the primaries. Ross Perot runs in the general election in 92. 96, uh, Pat Buchanan also challenges Bob Dole. Uh, Ross Perot is again a candidate uh, in November of that year. And there was a great deal of intellectual ferment on the right at that point. And uh, you not only see that in the presidential races, but you also see it in uh, Congress with the Republican takeover of Congress in 1994 after the midterm elections. And you see it uh, in the media as well with the development of conservative talk radio. Uh, you also have some very distinct viewpoints being articulated, not only by National Review, which had been around for a long time at that point, but also by the Weekly Standard, which gets started in 1995 by Chronicles Magazine, which represents kind of the paleoconservative perspective and is uh, in many ways the antithesis of the Weekly Standard. And so you had, a, you know, it was a very uh, fascinating time to be a young person who becomes interested in politics and starts, uh, you know, tuning in occasionally to uh, conservative talk radio, who starts picking up these conservative magazines and who wants to educate himself as to what's going on in uh, sort of the thinking of the right. And I was, I was, I think, drawn to the right because, um, it had, uh, it required a little bit more effort to become a conservative than it did to become uh, a kind of young progressive or a young Democrat. Uh, you had to question a lot of verities that had been taken for granted in mainstream culture in the uh, early 1990s, uh, especially about, you know, sort of um, just a kind of live and let live mentality that uh, people sort of naturally might have. And uh, I liked the very strong uh, moral case that Pat Buchanan made on issues like pro-life, for example. And uh, as I followed uh, Mr. Buchanan and looked at uh, some of the things that he was interested in, I began, I began to take an interest also in foreign policy, especially the non-interventionism he outlined. 
in uh, trade policy and the idea that perhaps things like NAFTA were not uh, so wonderful for the United States. Uh, and also in immigration and a number of other things that uh, people like Pat Buchanan had talked about. And so I was a, a conservative, I was on the right, but I was also you know, sort of questioning some of these uh, verities or orthodoxies, which uh, so much of the right represented even at that time. And uh, so that's kind of the, what got me interested in the first place in uh, a kind of conservatism that was different from uh, the sort of neoliberal version of conservatism. And uh, I deepened that knowledge during my undergraduate years in the late uh, 1990s and, and, and in the early 2000s as a graduate student. And then uh, when the Iraq war happened, I knew that I was very strongly opposed to the Iraq war, to the very uh, principles of an interventionist foreign policy that were behind the war. And uh, so I left grad school and went to work for the American conservative as a staff writer. And I stayed there for several years. Uh, I became a, an editor. And uh, then I left for a time and went to work for ISI as a uh, an editor in their books division. Uh, basically, I had been, I'd become kind of the literary editor of the American Conservative by around 2006. And I left and went to work for ISI Books because I wanted to see how the other side of the industry functioned, what it was like to produce books rather than to assign them for review. I did that for about a year. And then after that, uh, in 2008, I joined uh, the Ron Paul presidential campaign as its official campaign blogger. And uh, you know that lasted through the early part of the primary season in 2008. Then I returned to the American Conservative magazine, where in a year or so, I became uh, the editor-in-chief of the magazine. And then uh, following that, uh, I joined, uh, the, Ameri uh, I joined uh, the Fund for American Studies uh, as the director of the Robert Novak Journalism Fellowship Program. And uh, I also became editor of the quarterly journal, Modern Age. Can you tell us a little bit about how uh, the conservatism of, uh, of the American conservative and modern age is maybe not opposed necessarily, but definitely distinct from the kind of conservatism you see uh, in National Review, the Weekly Standard, all those, uh, those other more, uh, I suppose, establishment uh, papers? Well, there are a few different things here. So in the 1990s, um, there was this great vogue for uh, much more congressional reporting and much more direct political engagement on the part of conservative magazines like National Review. So National Review had been founded by Bill Buckley in the 1950s. And even though it always had a very pronounced Republican lean, it was a magazine uh, primarily of ideas. And it had intellectuals like James Burnham and Wilmore Kendall and Frank Meyer uh, contributing to its pages. And uh, by the early 1990s, there was kind of a feeling that there was a gap in the market for uh, more conservative reporting and more sort of news coming out of Congress, especially once Republicans take control of Congress after 1994. So you see a shift in National Review at that point. It becomes more about, uh, I don't wanna say just horse race and, and policy ideas, but it becomes less philosophical than it had been in the past. And you also see the beginnings of the Weekly Standard, which launches in 1995 as again, a very reporting focused and congressionally focused uh, publication. And you also at that same time see um, the kind of zenith of neoconservatism on the American right. And that lasts from about 1995 until uh, you know, maybe 2005 or so during the Bush, uh, George W. Bush years. Neoconservatism uh, takes a relatively more idealistic and interventionist view of foreign policy. Uh, so it's about exporting democracy, for example, and having a, a very strong uh, moralistic component to our foreign policy in the hopes that, you know, we can use our military force to uh, kind of midwife or bring about democratic change around the world. It also has uh, a tendency to support, um, to some degree, uh, a, a rather uh, lenient uh, policy towards borders and towards uh, immigration. And it also tends to be somewhat in favor of uh, free trade and a sort of global uh, inter uh, economic integration. Whereas the paleoconservatism uh, that was, you know, sort of one of the cores of the American Conservative magazine when it founded and it was founded in 2002, uh, is certainly very strongly critical of an idealistic and interventionist foreign policy. It also uh, was looking askance at our relationship even then with China and saying that American industry and American workers were being ill served by the free trade agenda you saw being promoted by libertarians and neoconservatives. And also uh, paleoconservatives of the sort that you found at the American Conservative and at Chronicles Magazine in the 1990s uh, were also critical of immigration and said that there should be, you know, sort of um, uh, strict uh, limits on immigration in general and that illegal immigration in particular should be something that was, um, uh, you know, sort of prevented. Um, now, Modern Age is somewhat different from uh, the American Conservative. It's not just a paleoconservative publication. It's a publication that been around since the 1950s itself. It was founded in 1957 by Russell Kirk, the author of The Conservative Mind. 
And Modern Age has been a, um, it's a, a rather ecumenical intellectual conservative magazine, but it has a traditionalist center of gravity, and in particular a traditionalist center that is very Kirkian. Uh, so what that means is that um, it's very anti-ideological. We don't like a kind of formulaic uh, approach to politics. And uh, we try to take, uh, you know, the, the history and the character of our country uh, very seriously. And the idea that there are, um, you know, sort of parts of our, our national personality that need to be preserved and that this takes, uh, you know, sort of active effort on our part. It's not simply a matter of always going with the most fashionable new trend, whether it's on the left or the right, in an attempt to create an America that's vastly better from something in the past. Well, I, uh, I, uh, and for, th for those exact reasons, I've always found Modern Age to be a, uh, a particularly interesting uh, magazine on all kinds of these fronts. Um, some of the best reviews, I think, on, uh, on the right. An interesting contrast to uh, what the Weekly Standard was putting out. Well, uh, so Silas, you come from a, uh, from a uh, kind of hetero heterodox background on the left yourself. Um, so uh, I was just uh, thinking that might be a good time for you to uh, discuss some of these things as well, too. Uh, with Dan on this front. So. Yeah, and well, one thing that I always appreciate is getting to know someone as a human before I get into a political debate with them. So um, it's nice to get to know a little bit of your story, Dan, and I'd love to know more like, where'd you grow up and uh, what'd your parents do? And, uh, you know, where do you live now? But um, for me, I'm, um, I was born in Louisiana um, and grew up in Houston, Texas. Um, and so I, I often characterize myself as a Texas Democrat. Um, well, that, what I mean by that is, though, um, on a policy agenda, I'm generally speaking going to vote pretty strongly Democrat. I don't um, talk the same way or really relate to the world the same way as what I think a lot of the trends of uh, Northeastern liberalism do. Um, my father was an Indian immigrant um, and my mother um, was a Scots-Irish um, from a small town in West Virginia with really long-standing roots in the U.S., like going back, I mean, like pre-revolutionary war. And on both sides of my family, the small town West Virginia and the southern India, there was a very strong traditionalism, um, a sense of family, authority, hierarchy, those kind of values, which are not, generally speaking, welcome in the, um, in the current ideological left. Um, and so though both sides had a very deep belief in care for um, the least advantaged in society and the, um, those who are, who are most vulnerable, so a lot of my uh, economic uh, ideological commitments come down on, on the left side of the aisle, there was very much more of a sense of Traditionalism. I won't call it quite cultural conservatism, but um, it, it has shades of it. And so, like, if I'm blue, I, I'm I'm a di very dark shade of purple, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, so that's kind of uh, where I come from politically. Um, in terms of professionally, I I um I went to school up in the Northeast, which was a major culture shock. I had never experienced uh, the kind of cultural difference within the United States that I experienced going there. Um, I went to a big public high school in, in Houston and came from, you know, this, you know, scrappy small town, West Virginia and, um, and immigrant background. And there was all this very elite, uh, very wealthy um, Northeastern kind of uh, environment there. there. People got very, even people I agree with on, um, on policy outcomes would get very offended at me for just the way I spoke. <laughs> and that was a little bit alienating. So I ended up making a lot of friends who were right wingers, even though I was a left winger, because um, we could get along because they wouldn't get mad when I talked. <laughs> um, and so um, that's actually how um, uh, Dan and I, I have a, a, a shared acquaintances from that, that time of political debate in college. And, um, and in, in the after after I left college, by the way, Dan, we were about two years different in high school, so it's interesting, the, the, the early 90s high school experience. <laughs> so um, after, after college, um, I really um, put my heart into um, education and educational equity. I, I, I was a teacher for a number of years, and um, then I started an education nonprofit that was devoted to helping teachers of, of underserved students to become better at teaching. Um, and uh, it's only in recent years where I've turned my attention back towards politics, which was always an interest of mine, but more in the sort of uh, extracurricular nature rather than in the core of my professional life. And I think that's been driven largely by some of the reasons that um, Braver Angels exist. That is to say, the, um, the sense that polarization is really doing something to destroy our country and that um, we're much closer to the brink than we, we, we might believe we are. And um, that it requires some kind of civic renewal to prevent that. So that, that, that's a overview of where I come from politically, and I guess a little bit personally. 
So um, I was wondering, uh, Dan, uh, we've, uh, w one of the, the, uh, the things I wanted to bring up in this conversation was just the exact heterodoxy on the right um, that, uh, that you've been uh, talking about, the, the fact that there's, number one, the neoconservatives versus the paleoconservatives. Uh, number two, there's uh, folks who are more focused on uh, purely ideological uh, ideas rather than, uh, uh, and then fo folks who are focusing more on traditional ideas. Um, and I was just wondering if you could give us a, a brief sketch in, uh, in your view of, uh, of where the coalition behind Trump, particularly the intellectuals who've supported Trump in the last five years or so, um, if, if you could outline uh, your take on, uh, on number one, uh, what their cases are, um, and number two, uh, what the different kinds of cases are on that front. I know there's a paleocon version of it, and there's a... Um, there's a traditionalist version of it. There's a Straussian version of it. But I was wondering uh, what your uh, uh, view of, uh, of the, the stronger cases for Trump on the further sides of the right are. Yeah, maybe I'll start out actually by uh, responding to uh, the point uh, about um, sort of personal uh, backgrounds. Um, you know, okay. I was born in small town Missouri. Um, my roots are primarily uh, my personal in terms of where I've spent the most time. Uh, Missouri, which is both where I was born and also where I went to college at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, the small town I was born in, uh, Sedalia, uh, it was represented for most of my childhood, in fact, until I was a young adult, by uh, a Democrat by the name of Ike Skelton, who was, you know, um, a pro-life Democrat. He was very much a World War II Democrat. Um, so someone who was, uh, you know, not on the right, uh, even as it was considered back then, but someone who um, would not be welcome on the left uh, today either. And um, so, you know, my kind of early um, sort of hometown experience is of that kind of politics uh, where you have, you know, uh, something that is maybe a bit more um, uh, in some ways centrist, middle of the road, but certainly, you know, a little bit conservative, a little bit progressive, uh, that old FDR kind of uh, democratic coalition. Um, that's, you know, kind of what my hometown was uh, uh, represented by in Congress. Um, I went to high school in Virginia. My, my, my parents lived in Virginia for, uh, you know, several years. And uh, I live in Virginia now, in Alexandria, Virginia. So I'm also uh, sort of uh, familiar with uh, the politics here. And I've seen this state go from being red to being very, perhaps briefly purple, and now being quite blue. Um, so here too, I've seen, uh, you know, a number of changes uh, take place. Uh, my father was in the U.S. Navy, so we have a certain uh, background in, uh, you know, a bit of international travel during the Cold War. Uh, and that informs some of my perspective as well. Um, you know, I've never served in the military myself, but a lot of my family members have, including uh, immediate family members. And in fact, my parents met uh, in the army. They met uh, during, the, during the Vietnam War, although they weren't in Vietnam, they were in uh, Korea. So, um, you know, I, ha I ha come from this sort of uh, 20th century background, uh, which I think, you know, it, it had its uh, severe flaws, of course, but it also, I think, uh, it did have less of a polarization in part because politics back then was a little bit more geographic than it is now. Now it's become much more um, sort of concatenated uh, in ideological change that stretch across the nation. Um, and that I think brings me to uh, this question of what the Donald Trump coalition is, and in particular who the intellectual uh, components of it are. And I think this has uh, been overlooked by a lot of mainstream commentators. Uh, they have a visceral reaction to Donald Trump himself. And so they're not very interested in, in sort of looking behind at um, the intellectual coalition that uh, is in fact quite supportive of Trump. And it's a vibrant one. Uh, and I think it's very interesting. You know, I signed on to a letter of, uh, I think it was called Scholars and Writers for America back in 2016, which was basically a pro-Trump uh, sort of group letter. And uh, you, you had represented there the editors of most of the uh, highbrow journals on the right. So, um, you know, uh, people from, I was there as, as the American conservative. You had uh, Roger Kimball from the New Criterion. Uh, I think Rusty Reno from uh, First Things at that point was the signatory. Um, so these more intellectual journals on the right had already uh, become very interested in uh, Donald Trump and saw things in the Trump movement that represented some of their own interests. So as you've alluded to, Luke, um, part of it is you do have a kind of a deeply searching uh, Christian co uh, conservatism that is starting to question some of the uh, coalition uh, orthodoxies of the conservative movement as it was in the 1990s and early 2000s. So, um, you know, first things, and I think uh, Patrick Deneen, who's a, a very uh, stimulating thinker, they're all starting to say, um, wait a minute, what have we really been getting out of the economic policies, for example, 
that conservatives have uh, signed on to uh, during uh, you know, the, the 1990s and early 2000s. And they look at Donald Trump and they say perhaps Donald Trump represents a turn away from uh, this kind of ultra market orthodoxy. And um, what Donald Trump represents, what kind of new economics might emerge that they may be less invested in. But the first step is simply to get away from uh, what had become a kind of stale uh, approach towards uh, um, economic policy. Then you have, uh, you've alluded to the Straussians. I think this is a kind of golden age for the Claremont Institute, which is producing uh, some very provocative, very uh, thoughtful material, both in the Claremont Review of Books and also in their new uh, web journal, American Mind. And, um, you know, they represent um, a view that um, America uh, is getting away from its founding philosophy rooted in the Declaration of Independence. And so they're very concerned about things like the 1619 Project. They're very concerned with a kind of uh, historical revisionism that you see. Uh, but they've also questioned, uh, you know, many of the things that um, conservatives had taken for granted, again, during the George W. Bush years. So I see a lot of change um, with the Claremont Institute in terms of how they talk about foreign policy, for example, and also they become uh, skeptical of the verities about uh, trade policy. And then, uh, of course, you have uh, paleoconservatives. Um, and the funny thing is the paleoconservatives of the 1990s tend to be such a fractious and um, argumentative group that it's hard to say that they're actually a big component of the new Trump coalition because they're still sort of uh, off to their own, uh, you know, sort of with a number of criticisms of uh, many things. There's also uh, a longstanding tendency among the paleoconservative right to become a kind of literary and philosophical and to disengage from politics. Uh, there's a tendency towards, um, you know, a preference for, um, uh, a kind of uh, literary and, um, um, you know, sort of a disengaged critical perspective on politics as opposed to uh, uh, putting their confidence in, uh, in princes, putting their confidence in, in political leaders. Uh, and then you also have, I think, uh, a number of people who might be considered um, kind of new centrists of a sort. Uh, my friend Frank Buckley, for example, at uh, George Mason University, he uh, you know, is someone who is a spokesperson for a kind of Trumpian nationalism, but what that nationalism means, in fact, is uh, more support for working class America and for economic policies that might have been uh, you know, the appropriate economic policies of someone like JFK back in the 1960s. Um, so that, I think, is a new development on the right. And I think people like Oren Cass also represent uh, something uh, parallel to that movement. And someone like Julius Krein, who's actually been quite critical of Donald Trump, but whose uh, uh, publication, American Affairs, represents this kind of rethinking of, uh, of right-wing orthodoxies. So you have these various uh, streams, which are all, not all identical. They don't all agree on everything. Uh, but they all come together in saying that uh, Donald Trump represents um, a real change in American thinking especially thinking on the right, thinking among conservatives, and a real sort of clearing of the decks uh, and an opening of, uh, you know, the way towards uh, fresher thought uh, in the future. So uh, let me just uh, say on the record here that uh, I have always found the Orrin Cass and Julius Krein group of those uh, to be one of the most port uh, portentous uh, potential movements on the uh, on the political right nowadays, just because of the the sheer level of institutional influence that their projects are working on doing, so which I've always found to be interesting. Uh, but on that note as well, uh, Dan, as you as you uh, you mentioned earlier, there's not just these uh, these uh, uh, um, pro-Trump uh, dissidents inside the GOP and pro-Trump uh, establishments inside the GOP. But there's also a, uh, within, within conservatism, uh, the neoconservatives have largely moved leftward uh, since the, uh, the beginning of the Trump era. There have been certain libertarians who've moved leftward. You've seen the crystallization of things like the Never Trump movement and the, uh, the, uh, the Scannon Center generally trying to promote an alternative vision uh, on these sorts of things. Could you talk a little bit about how those uh, relate to the uh, the Trumpian uh, side of uh, uh, side of the conservative coalition as well. Yeah, you know, um, 15 years ago, a lot of libertarians and a lot of paleo conservatives and um, conservatives who were critical of George W. Bush's foreign policy were all very much on the same side. Uh, in that they, you know, all saw the Iraq War as being uh, a very bad decision on the part of the Bush administration, and they were all very critical of neoconservatives as sort of. Um, promoters of that kind of foreign policy vision, that very activist vision. Um, 
What is interesting now is that you've seen a kind of realignment where a lot of libertarians, especially here in Washington, D.C., and its environs, have uh, now aligned with the neoconservatives in criticizing Donald Trump. Uh, they certainly, both, Donald, both the neoconservatives and the libertarians don't like Donald Trump's uh, uh, economic policies. They don't like the so-called trade war. Uh, they tend not to like uh, Donald Trump's immigration policies, although there's you know, some, some variety among neocons uh, on, uh, on immigration questions. And, uh, and also, I think you just see a stylistic change as well, that a lot of libertarians are very uncomfortable with a populist style. Not all libertarians, in particular, the libertarians associated with the Ludwig von Mises Institute in uh, Auburn, Alabama, tend to be very favorable towards populism. And some uh, you know, folks within the Ron Paul movement tend to have a populist side as well. But a lot of uh, libertarian policy minds here in the D.C. area are uh, very alarmed by populism. They think of it as having you know, very sort of anti-intellectual tendencies, very you know, nationalist tendencies in the, the worst sense of the word and so forth. Um, and uh, they have formed common cause with um, neoconservatives uh, like uh, Bill Kristol, for example, who's now a, a never Trump type, um, in terms of uh, criticizing uh, not only uh, Donald Trump himself and the Trump administration, but also uh, the right as a whole as it has developed. And that has made them much more favorable towards the Democratic Party, towards Joe Biden, and towards some sort of grand coalition with progressives. It's very interesting. Um, you know, if you look at uh, a lot of the most prominent names in, um, uh, on the op-ed pages, for example, people like Brett Stevens or David Brooks in the New York Times, uh, if you look at uh, many of the conservatives um, who, or people who were thought to be conservatives on uh, channels like MSNBC, people who were, you know, kind of there as um, the designated conservative spokesperson uh, on an otherwise liberal channel, um, they're almost all never Trump. And what I think is, needs to be a lesson taken from this moment is that too many progressives, too many liberals, too many Democrats, um, and too many centrists were simply looking for the conservatives who were closest to themselves uh, before this Donald Trump moment arose. And as a result, they kind of got a, a mis mistaken impression as to what conservatives think, because they weren't going and sort of looking at um, people who had the more sort of um, surprising ideas. They were looking at people who, in many respects, um, seemed uh, very much like themselves, professionally as well as ideologically. And that was a mistake. I think actually, you know, if we want to talk about depolarization, one thing you have to do is bring in, you know, uh, the Ralph Nader left and the Pat Buchanan right, you can't just have a conversation between the George Bush uh, right and the, uh, you know, sort of Bill and Hillary Clinton left. Dan, I'd love to pick up on something that you mentioned there. So you said that they have a lot of these uh, um, conservatives or at least people that they think of as conservatives. Um, and so to me, I'm really interested um, in what makes you feel that Donald Trump is a conservative um, and more broadly, when you describe the things that you stood for, or at least the, uh, I took it implicitly as that the coalition you described is aligned with you and from other things you've written and said, I, I largely take you to be um, one, non-interventionist in foreign policy, two, more skeptical of a globalist free trade policy, and three, more strict on immigration. Um, so uh, if that's a fair characterization of you, um, I, I'm curious, you know, a lot of that sounded very reasonable to me. Um, I, I'm a die in the wool Democrat. You're, uh, you're a pro-Trump uh, Republican. Uh, I'm just really curious. Tell me about how these are conservative ideas and tell me why these other ideas that have been associated with conservatism in the past um, are so at odds with those. Yeah, you see a lot of crossover right now. And uh, Michael Lind, for example, is one of the uh, thinkers who is uh, kind of most interesting to a lot of young nationalist uh, style conservatives. And Michael Lind, of course, is someone who, um, well, actually at one point he was even kind of a neoconservative, uh, but he broke with neoconservatism and he broke with uh, conservatism in general back in the 1990s. And he wrote uh, a book called Up From Conservatism uh, on that very theme. Uh, and yet Michael Lind, uh, because he talks about some of these themes that we've been discussing, uh, is of keen interest to a lot of uh, young conservatives, including some uh, who are on the staff of people like uh, Marco Rubio. And you've seen Marco Rubio uh, produce some uh, policy papers on trade and economics, which actually draw from Michael Lind's ideas. And um, you know, while you're not going to find a Pat Buchanan citation in a, a Marco Rubio paper, perhaps, uh, a lot of these ideas were things that paleoconservatives uh, you know, had been talking about uh, going back uh, 20 and 30 years. Now, um, as far as uh, the conservatism of Donald Trump, first of all, Donald Trump's not an ideologue. And that by itself is kind of a good thing. Um, and you know, there's conservatism as a philosophy. There's conservatism as simply a negation of ideology. 
And uh, then there are conservatisms that might be considered ideological and then programmatic. Donald Trump is not a programmatic conservative. So in that sense, you know, he's not someone who, um, you know, uh, has been developed by the conservative movement and, you know, sort of subscribes to its orthodoxies. Although what's very interesting is that he is um, transactional in his approach to politics. And he has this sense of being the leader of a coalition that includes, you know, these uh, conventional Republican elements. And he wants to give every element of the coalition uh, its highest priority. So, for example, you had uh, the tax bill of about two years ago, which was um, kind of manna from heaven for Grover Norquist. You have, uh, you know, uh, a number of steps which, um, you know, you would think that uh, neoconservatives would have been quite happy with, such as the movement of the American uh, embassy in uh, Israel to Jerusalem. This was something which nominally neoconservatives have been in favor of for a long time. But when Donald Trump actually did it, uh, you found that it didn't uh, serve to propitiate people like uh, Bill Kristol. Um, so Donald Trump, uh, even though he's not a programmatic uh, ideological conservative, he is sufficiently devoted to the coalition that is behind him that he has, in fact, been proceeding in a kind of Reagan-like fashion almost in terms of checking those boxes of um, most of uh, the conservative coalition's views. But Donald Trump has some of his own views that break from uh, the orthodoxies of the coalition, especially on trade. I would defend uh, the uh, Donald Trump view on trade and, and certainly the sort of um, paleoconservative view on trade uh, in the sense that, you know, American sovereignty and the cohesion of America as a country requires the cohesion of its different classes and layers. And that if you wind up with a country that is um, adopting policies that serve its, you know, sort of wealthiest and most financialized interests very well by creating a, a globalized uh, kind of economy, that uh, is undercutting you know, a lot of working class and manufacturing and sort of Rust Belt state Americans, then you're going to wind up with a lot of um, political disruptions as well as a lot of, you know, sort of economic hardship for uh, millions of Americans. And so I think you know, it's, it's a fundamentally good policy for America. And in that sense, I consider it conservative in that it's conserving the um, you know, sort of well-being of the country. And I would not have any hesitation in welcoming progressives who, you know, support it and want to call it a progressive policy because it's good for, you know, uh, the progress of Americans who are working class or who are not, you know, highly, uh, you know, leveraged in uh, the financial sector. Um, and I would welcome that kind of larger coalition. And Pat Buchanan back in the 90s used to uh, actually cooperate with uh, Ralph Nader on uh, a number of uh, policy fronts. Um, and then, uh, you know, with respect to non-interventionist foreign policy, uh, it seems to me that American interventionism with a highly idealistic character is really uh, most fundamentally a Wilsonian policy as opposed to a policy that had been uh, traditional for the Republican Party. Uh, the Republican Party, in fact, uh, has, you know, up until the 1990s was uh, the less interventionist party. And most of America's largest wars uh, took place under Democrats. And, um, you know, World War II is a necessary war but it's a war that uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, obviously involved um, a great growth of government and uh, a great change in the nature of the American polity. And uh, I think there's always been an element of not isolationism, but an element of skepticism about foreign intervention on the American right and among, uh, you know, sort of old guard Republicans, precisely because they see war as a fundamentally revolutionary force and they don't want uh, us to be um, sort of, um, so involved in these ideological abstractions abroad that we wind up uh, losing a sense of cohesion right here at home. Let me just follow that up and ask, um, tell me if I'm characterizing you correctly. It sounds like you're saying that Donald Trump isn't really a conservative, but he kind of gives a little bit of um, red meat to the uh, more recent threat of, threat of conservatism while serving as a, a useful vehicle for an older set of conservatism, which is more non-interventionist and um, uh, a nationalist in nature. Does that well, sound fair? Um, I, would, I would put it this way. Um, ideological conservatism wound up being conservative in terms of the label that was put on the tin, but it's not actually conservative. It is Wilsonian in foreign policy. It is, uh, you know, it, it has uh, such a uh, large commitment to a financial economy and a global economy that it winds up not being very conservative for, you know, communities here in America. And uh, in terms of, you know, it's relatively um, easygoing attitude towards immigration, that also tends to be something that's quite transformative towards, you know, the communities in the country. 
So uh, I would say that ideological conservatism is actually not conservative. But of course, it's the thing that many people, you know, because they've seen it labeled that way for so long, they think that that is the definition of conservatism. Donald Trump, because he breaks away from that and because he adopts a number of policies that actually are conservative in their effects, is in fact a better real world conservative than the sort of ideological types uh, who had defined conservatism for about 30 years between the you know, sort of early 1990s and 2016. One of the things that I've, uh, I've profited most from in my friendship with uh, our mutual friend Dan, Jeff Cabservice, is the, um, the notion that uh, the kind of ideological litmus test style of politics has generally been non-conducive to pragmatism in this kind of thing. Uh, obviously, Jeff comes from probably the opposite side of the conservative aisle from where you're coming from on this, uh, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a universally valid uh, observation there as well. And I, uh, I only wish there were ways our politics uh, could adapt itself to be more flexible on that front. And on the note of flexibility, um, I, uh, I am a, uh, a connoisseur of internet meme pages in various ways. And uh, one of my favorites is a page called New Developments in Horseshoe Theory that uh, goes and looks around at weird ways that uh, very far left progressives and very far right conservatives um, and uh, even uh, even like the anarchistic and the uh, the nearly racialist kind of types of those things say surprisingly similar things on some fronts. Um, and I, I think that, that all traces to some degree to the fact that uh, in the aftermath of the uh, in, in the late 2010s, possibly um, due to some things that happened in the Obama administration, possibly due to the election of President Trump, uh, there's uh, there's. Uh, you find uh, Bill Kristol siding with, uh, say, Jeffrey Goldberg at the Atlantic more frequently than you ever would have ex expected it previously. And you also find Josh Hawley and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez saying weirdly similar things. Uh, it's, it's as if there's a part of the right that has learned to love labor and a part of the left that has learned to love banks. Um, and the, they have kind of parallel coalitions that don't really work together very efficaciously at this moment, but it begins to, to seem that there might be not only opportunities for, uh, for, uh, for partnership, like you're saying here, Dan, but possibly uh, a realignment of coalitions. And maybe that would be, uh, th maybe that would still be across parties. Maybe you'd still have um, nationalist Democrats and nationalist Republicans versus, uh, uh, let's say, neoliberal Democrats and neoliberal Republicans. Uh, but perhaps there's room for um, for these kind of blocks to more consciously organize themselves to work together on this kind of stuff. Um, I, in my view, it seems like Julius Krein's work over at uh, American Affairs has done that most explicitly at this point. Uh, but do you think there's, uh, particularly on the social side of things, where you have the real actual gap between democratic socialists and uh, Rod Dreher type, uh, type uh, traditionalists and uh, Patrick Deneen and Rusty Reno type traditionalists, do you think there's room for pragmatic compromise between those far left cultural and far right cultural uh, or just general traditionalist cultural uh, factions on policy grounds? Well, there are going to be a number of questions of fundamental principle um, where, you know, there necessarily have to be differences and there can't be um, a, a theoretical middle ground, um, you know, on some of these questions like um, uh, reproductive rights versus the right to life. Um, you know, there are certain questions about human nature that have to be answered one way or the other, and depending on how you answer that, um, you're going to have uh, a view which is going to be starkly opposite from uh, per persons who answer the question the other way. That said, um, a lot of these, you know, sort of highly philosophical questions um, are less um, apparent at the uh, level of ordinary life, right? So uh, in a lot of uh, towns and localities and, and even cities for that matter, you actually don't find these uh, such sharp divisions. And in fact, what, yeah, what I think you tend to find is that in a lot of localities, a lot of smaller uh, towns and whatnot, um, you know, there's uh, a certain uh, fellow feeling among some of the more progressive elements and some of the more conservative elements. It's not because it's not polarized. It's not viewed ideologically. Uh, people simply are um, thinking of themselves as, as Texans, for example, as we'd heard uh, earlier. Um, and you find that in cities too, because in, you know, uh, if you look at uh, New York City, you'll find uh, a lot more uh, conservatives who are um, pro-choice, for example, than you would in other parts of the country. Just you'll find more pro-life Democrats you know, in, in, in Texas and elsewhere. Um, so when you actually get down to um, the 
nitty gritty and, and, and you know, sort of zoom in on the places where people live and the context in which they live their lives, a lot of these uh, stark philosophical uh, oppositions don't wind up being sources of daily uh, sort of conflict. Well, where they become sources of conflict is as you get to a national level and as you try to have you know, a, a decisive political uh, conclusion to these debates. And um, given the nature of our system, which is not only federal as well as national, but also within the federal government, uh, you have these different loci of sovereignty, the Supreme Court, Congress, and the executive, they all have the power to advance agendas um, you know, in different ways. Um, you're going to have you know, conflict that never quite gets fully resolved. And people just need to be comfortable with a degree of disagreement. And it can be disagreement on the most you know, powerful principled issues. Uh, nevertheless, it's not going to go away. So you need to be prepared to deal with it in a, a bold and uh, robust, but also kind of civil and humane fashion. Well, this starts to go not only to questions of polarization, but also questions of localism and the geographic disparateness of so many American communities uh, that people like Joel Kotkin and uh, Yuval Levin and various others from different perspectives have, have written about. We could probably do a whole podcast about that, um, but uh, we'll refrain on that for this moment. Um, we're getting up to about the last 10 minutes. So real quick uh, for the, um, first off, we have things about the 2020 election to discuss. Uh, but before we get into that, I'd like to, uh, just for the benefit of our listeners, um, Dan uh, talked about his background, Silas talked about his background, so I'll just give a very brief introduction of mine. Um, I'm from a different generation than Dan and Silas. I uh, am, uh, am uh, one of the older millennials, I think, um, or maybe, uh, maybe middle, middle time frame millennials. Um, born in 1993 uh, and uh, grew up with my father in the Navy. Uh, just a Midwestern, uh, Midwestern white boy, uh, white ethnic Catholics. Uh, my mother is an immigrant from the Philippines. Um, and uh, from, the, from the earliest time of my life, I just remember um, conservatism being gospel, Reaganism being gospel. Ronald Reagan was uh, probably about as close to a, uh, a Republican patron saint as any of them that I grew up with. And, um, and then my family moved all over the country uh, every two or three years, just given that my dad was in the Navy. My dad served in, the, uh, in Operation Enduring Freedom, and then again in Operation Iraqi Freedom, and then in various other uh, capacities. And uh, I grew up in California, in Washington State, um, in Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, Texas, Wisconsin, Virginia, anywhere that touches the water and has Navy pre presence, um, I uh, was basically there. So I grew up uh, kind of... Um, intrinsically being a nationalist, intrinsically looking for um, how, do, how do we do, uh, do American nationhood and how do we all serve our country properly and build this more perfect union or whatever. And maybe uh, there was a, a romantic kind of side to that uh, with uh, the historical stuff. But uh, I was basically a run-of-the-mill conservative. I uh, started falling in with Ayn Rand in, uh, in late high school. Um, and I'm actually glad I did because that uh, opened up a lot of philosophical yeah, yeah. It opened up a lot of philosophical questions that pushed me on my direction uh, of, uh, of self-education that led me to Alexander Hamilton and Michael Lind, and eventually through to um, the various other uh, new nationalists who we've talked about here. Um, so, uh, so, you know, um, that's, that was my backdrop there. And then going to uh, the University of Southern California, a very uh, mainstream school, which is to say a, a culturally liberal school, and figuring out what it's like to be the uh, the conservative who goes and pisses everybody off. And then in the, uh, given that uh, halfway through that, um, I decided I didn't want to piss anybody off anymore. Um, I decided to uh, try to start writing more like Ross Douthat. And I suppose that that influence has uh, been one of the things that's uh, both led me to Braver Angels and led me to think about conservatism the way that I have. So, um, so basically, that's where I am. I'm conservative. I'm uh, more a nationalist, I think, than a Republican, per se. Um, I, uh, I can imagine myself voting Democrat uh, in some elections, um, both historically and in the present day time frame, though I normally vote Republican. Um, and uh, as we approach the 2020 election, um, that just opens up, what does this mean for uh, for, uh, for how people like me, perhaps, but also people like you, Silas, and people like you, Dan, are going to vote. Um, so uh, let's just finish off this conversation for the last couple of minutes just talking about um, what's really at stake in the 2020 election. Um, some people have said it's going to be a new uh, Flight 93 election. Others have uh, said it's going to be 
um, just any other election. Some have thought it compared it to the 1920 election return to normalcy. Um, so, uh, Dan, what's your thoughts on that first off? No, I think there's been this long-term tendency since the early 1990s to question the post-Cold War dispensation of politics and economics within America. And so in the early 1990s, this took the form of the populist uh, insurgencies of Pat Buchanan and Ross Perot. And also, you know, back in 1992, uh, Bill Clinton himself presented uh, himself as something of a populist. And, um, you know, Bill Clinton wore a couple of different masks, uh, first uh, in the campaign in 92, then as actually a quite uh, hard left um, president in his first year in office. And then after that, as a triangulating something of a, a kind of centrist figure uh, after the Republicans take control of Congress. So in the 90s, you had, um, you know, ultimately a, uh, a populist uprising that winds up failing. And, you know, maybe because of internet uh, prosperity, you know, the technological boom and everything, Americans kind of uh, are happy with neoliberalism for about a decade. Then you get to the George W. Bush years, and it's starting to become clear that neoliberalism has a tremendous price tag. In terms of foreign policy, you get the Iraq war, which starts out, you know, seemingly to be a very quick and easy victory, but then turns out to be something which um, leads to an ongoing uh, civil war within the country, a sectarian conflict. Uh, and uh, the hopes for a kind of, um, you know, almost a Swiss style democracy are just, you know, completely outlandish. Um, and that you have these engagements, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan, which go on forever. At the same time as you have, you know, China getting into the WTO, and you have uh, American uh, trade policies and policies, you know, in economics broadly, which are um, creating more economic inequality in our country. And you see that um, this is the era when uh, the returns to labor versus the returns to capital start to really you know, split even more than before. Um, and so you see a, um, a turn away from the you know, kind of neoliberal uh, post-Cold War establishment, um, starting with, I think, Barack Obama. Barack Obama runs as the candidate of hope and change. And it turns out that he's actually not able to change as much as he might have wanted in part because he's surrounded by, you know, he has um, Hillary Clinton and John Kerry, who are, you know, both Democrats who voted for the Iraq war as his secretaries of state. He has, you know, Joe Biden, who's been around since the 1970s as his vice president. And uh, so I think the American public was very frustrated with the Obama years. And as a result, you saw uh, the rise of Bernie Sanders in the Democratic primaries in 2016 and the rise of Donald Trump in the Republican party. And of course, Donald Trump wins the 2016 election. So um, this represents, you know, a kind of uh, a cry out by Americans, not just, you know, right wing Americans, but I think Americans who supported Bernie Sanders, Americans who switched from being Obama voters to Trump voters, all of them are sick of the dispensation that um, the Bushes and the Clintons basically uh, gave the country um, in the 1990s and have tried to continue giving it uh, thereafter. And uh, so Donald Trump comes into office and, um, you know, he is personally, uh, a more radical figure in many ways than Barack Obama was, I think it's fair to say. He's, you know, a very different kind of personality than anything we've seen in American politics uh, heretofore. And uh, he's pursued a number of policies and um, he's faced opposition within the Republican Party to some degree. And also, of course, uh, you know, he lost uh, control of the House of Representatives in 2018. So I think a lot of uh, people who voted in 2016 for Donald Trump are kind of wondering what can Trump deliver in uh, a second term? Is he going to be able to follow through on some of these changes that he promised? Or are they going to be bogged down, even if Donald Trump wants to make these changes, are they going to be frustrated by both the Republican establishment and by uh, the Democrats controlling the House of Representatives? When people look at Joe Biden, I think their question is, is Joe Biden kind of backsliding? Is he going back to kind of uh, the 1990s program that people have rejected? Or uh, has Joe Biden kind of learned a lesson? Um, if you look at uh, at least the trade policies that, that Joe Biden's been putting out, if you look at the things that, Do that Joe Biden says about foreign policy, despite the fact that Biden himself voted for the Iraq war, he now claims that he would be, you know, a much more non-interventionist kind of leader. And in fact, uh, you know, his website even uses the phrase as forever war or endless war. Uh, it sounds like Tulsi Gabbard wrote his uh, <laughs> part of his foreign policy plank. Uh, so the question is, are Americans going to trust that? Are they going to think that Joe Biden really is going to be, you know, at uh, almost 80 years of age, uh, a very different kind of Democrat than he's been in the, in the past? Or are they going to see him as, you know, sliding back? And possibly sliding back is what people want. Maybe they think that Donald Trump has gone a little too far and that uh, there's a need to kind of retrench. 
Um, but I think those are the key issues here. And my own view is that it would be a big mistake to go back to uh, you know, the older mentalities and that in fact, we really do need, what we really need and what I would have liked to have seen would have been a Trump versus Sanders race. Because I think there you would have brought out the most fundamental differences, but also the most fundamental sort of recognition on the, on the part of both candidates as to the foreign policy and economic and sort of overall questions about, uh, you know, are we serving the country as a whole or, or are we only serving kind of a, an ideological and financial faction of the country uh, with our policies? Well, I'm sure had the, uh, the editorial board of Modern Age come out with a ringing endorsement of Bernie Sanders for the Democratic nomination for the President of the United States, uh, earlier in 2020 or so, it would have been a, uh, a, uh, an, another interesting kind of moment in this horseshoe, horseshoe theory and acceleration of American politics. So, well, we are getting uh, pretty close to the end here. So Silas, do you have any last uh, questions or thoughts uh, for Dan while we have him here? Well, actually, I'd love to just um, offer kind of, um, if, uh, if not a rebuttal, a counterpoint to Dan's um, framing of what's at stake in the election. Um, you know, I think we did a good job here of um, creating some uh, common ground I, was surprising to me, but um, uh, I really agreed with a lot of what Dan said today and um, actually really enjoyed the kind of shared emphasis on history, culture, community. Um, and at the same time, uh, we never got to the spicy part. So <laughs> I, um, Dan, I hope you come back some time to, to uh, mix it up a, with a little bit more with us, but I'll just say what, um, what to me is at the heart of that spicy part um, or that, that place of real conflict. Um, uh, when I look at what's at stake in this election, I don't see it as a matter of a uh, question of free trade policy or not, a question of uh, intervention or not in foreign affairs. Um, we might agree on those points, actually. Um, but for me, there's there's two real things at stake here. One is a set of constitutional issues. Um, particularly, the most important thing that is at stake in this election is whether the election is conducted freely and fairly and whether both sides accept the outcome. Um, and I'm very, very concerned about um, a very likely scenario where it looks like Donald Trump's ahead on election night and then mail-in ballots come afterwards and so show that both Joe Biden actually won and um, Donald Trump says they cheated by mail-in ballots as, as he's been announcing. Um, but that is to me is a, is a very small subset of a broader set of issues about whether we believe in the legitimacy of our, our um, political institutions. And that's what's really at stake for me and that's what I'm really concerned about. Um, on the other side, we didn't talk very much about nationalism, and I really wish we could have gone deeper into that subject because, you know, um, I'm going to try and say this in a way that doesn't uh, make it impossible to engage, even though I know we don't have time to really engage <laughs> afterwards, but to, to just, Dan, to, to really let you know where I'm coming from and hopefully to let some of the people who are in your audience know where I'm coming from. Um, I, I love many of the, of the concepts behind a patriotic American ideal and yet I could never declare myself a nationalist. And the simple reason for that is because I'm not white. And I don't mean that as a insult against anybody who's you know, European by descent. Half my family is European by descent. But what I mean is um, nationalism as distinct from patriotism so, uh, asks the question of who are the real Americans? You know, what is the nation we're fighting for? And throughout a huge part of my life growing up in, te growing up in Texas, you know, it was just very unambiguous to people that me, that people were going to treat me like I was some strange outsider uh, um, intruding upon what was really rightfully theirs. And that's how I felt through the entire Donald Trump era. And most people I know who, who share some element of that, that's, that's what's, what's been at stake for me in this whole era is whether I belong in this country, whether people will say that I'm as American as they are. And so that, that issue is just incredibly hard for me to get around. And I think that's what's at stake for a lot of people in this. And I don't mean that as an insult to you or to the, many ideas that you've put forward that I might agree with, but it's impossible for me to get behind a, a nationalism that doesn't make space for me um, or for my family or for at least half my family. Um, and so that, that, that's really what it's about for me. And I think this is a wonderful cliffhanger to, uh, to leave us on as we, uh, as we uh, say farewell to the audience uh, for the time being. Um, but then uh, those are some of the uh, some of the other issues that uh, if you would be open to it at some later date months for, months from now after the election, uh, I would love to bring you back on the podcast to chat more deeply about some of these issues as well. So yeah, I think the key question is, you know, is shared citizenship uh, the the ideal that we should be aiming for, which I think it is. Uh, but if so, you know, what are the difficulties of getting to that ideal? And does it involve you know, uh, a critique of identity politics on the left, as well as a critique of uh, the attitudes that um, you know, have just been mentioned uh, you know, that one might find in the less um, 
you know, sort of welcoming parts of Texas. So with that, uh, we are just about on the hour now. And uh, after a wonderful, fascinating conversation, we're going to have to go. But uh, Dan, on behalf of Braver Angels, thank you very much for joining us on this episode of the Braver Angels podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And uh, Silas, wonderful uh, co-hosting with you. Looking forward to the next one of these. So with that, uh, for those listening, uh, you just listened to uh, a, uh, a conversation about um, the, uh, the present state of affairs in America and uh, more specifically the present state of affairs in intellectual conservatism um, discussed not only by two uh, explosive conservatives, myself and Dan McCarthy, but uh, also a, a, a Braver Angels friend of mine, Silas Kulkarni, who, as you can tell, is very much not a member of these conservative circles. And this kind of conversation is what Braver Angels tries to do and tries to promote uh, in various ways, through various programs and uh, all sorts of things. And as you can see with the uh, state of uh, public discourse in America, this is the kind of thing that we would love to be able to uh, uh, have as a counterpoint to the more vitriolic kinds of engagements that happen quite frequently. So if you're interested in joining us at Braver Angels, you can find us at braverangels.org. Uh, plenty of ways to get involved. We're always looking for volunteers. And uh, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe to this podcast uh, because uh, there's more content like this coming out every week. Meantime, if you uh, like the things that Dan McCarthy was saying, uh, feel free to take a look at his, uh, the journal he edits, uh, Modern Age. He also has plenty of fascinating writings at places as diverse as uh, um, uh, the American Conservative, the National Interest, uh, and uh, First Things Magazine, and various other places. And uh, for my money, it's been... Uh, really, really in interesting seeing his, uh, his thoughts on all kinds of things over the course of the last couple of years. So uh, uh, Dan McCarthy's writing is a wonderful thing to read. Um, so anyhow, uh, we invite anybody who's interested to join us in on this conversation. Uh, Braver Angels is always looking for more people to work with. And uh, we at Braver Angels are building a House United and invite all Americans to join us. Uh, thank you and have a wonderful week.